but but what an amazing uh, start for the day. I was just I was telling Aaron that we had uh, President Joyce Banda of Malawi was a fellow with uh, my program for a year. And one of the hotly debated issues that we had with President Banda, she continued to make a statement that leaders were born, not created. So we had um, a number of, of intense debates in this room about leadership and whether they, uh, leaders are born or created. And we have a um, global women's leadership program here at the Wilson Center where we actually deconstruct questions about gender and leadership. And just this week, we've released a new global index looking at women's political leadership. So these questions on gender and leadership are a very critical set of issues that we are, are working towards here at the Wilson Center. So I was really glad to see that coming out in, in our discussions this morning. So I'm really pleased that we get on to our second panel where we're looking at additional questions that we have been exploring in the Resilience Academy around livelihoods. So we have uh, more of our colleagues from the Academy and to, uh, this this session will be moderated by Jakob Reiner, who is the Vice Rector at the UN University in Europe and Director of the UNU Institute for Environment and Human Security. He's a professor at the Agricultural Fac uh, Faculty of the Rheinischen Frederick Williams University in, in Bonn. And prior to joining UNU, he served as the director of the Swiss Federal Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research in Davos, where he had previously acted as the institute's head of the Avalanche Warning and Risk Management uh, Division. So, Jakob, I, I hand it over to you. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, Roger and Mark, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good morning again. Uh, we had a very interesting session about a uh, very multifaceted and very uh, sometimes a contentious theme of, uh, of loss and damage. And uh, we're now going to livelihood resilience. And there you might expect that it uh, would be completely opposite because when you have uh, livelihood talk about resilience, you are uh, generating a general nodding uh, that no one can be or would be against resilience. Uh, we had in our uh, project with MRF, which was, uh, was, which was a, a project which was parallel to the Resilience Academy, the so-called uh, Kibika project. Kibika is uh, Bangladeshi for, uh, for livelihood. Uh, talked uh, about livelihood resilience uh, in connection with environmental migration, with the question on uh, when and how and if at all uh, people would uh, migrate because uh, they consider their livelihood resilience not, not given anymore. So that's uh, an angle where we came from. Uh, my and probably uh, many of yours uh, experience with livelihood is that when you go into more detail either on a scientific level or because uh, you are trying to get resilience, uh, deal with re resilience on the ground, uh, then uh, unified opinions uh, change and uh, you're starting to discuss and you see that uh, everybody maybe means something slightly different uh, with resilience, that things can even uh, get contentious. And uh, as a scientist, we uh, then tend to have uh, big academic discussions on, uh, on, on, on definitions. Uh, this is certainly necessary, and I would like to go into such a discussion, but we choose a completely different approach. Uh, uh, I have uh, four outstanding uh, speakers uh, with me on uh, the podium. Uh, coming from very different backgrounds, from uh, universities, working at universities, but uh, working with NGOs, uh, being consultants to UN uh, organizations. Uh, and uh, they will uh, hopefully, and I'm sure, uh, I have seen their presentations partly, uh, look at uh, resilience from completely different uh, positions. And uh, I am very much confident that we will have a, a, a very uh, rich insight on what resilience and, uh, and, and, uh, and developing resilience uh, really means in academia and in practice. Uh, we're going uh, with a slightly different model in this uh, second session. Uh, we're having all the talks in front and then uh, the discussion uh, for all, all of them together because we, uh, I think we need to stop 
at uh, 12 sharp and I'm always followed by nightmares that the last presenter has no time to speak anymore and I really want to avoid it so we can regulate it better. So uh, I would like to start uh, with the first presenter, uh, Jana uh, Junghardt, just to my uh, left. Uh, Jana is a geographer from the uh, Rhein-Westfälische University, as it is very complicated names, the German University of Bonn, and uh, is now working uh, with uh, Caritas, a renowned uh, Swiss uh, humanitarian aid organization, as an advisor for disaster risk reduction. Uh, she has extensive experience in uh, development cooperation, and I'm very happy to announce uh, the uh, uh, the, the presentation at the front line, building a coalition for local level monitoring of risk governance and resilience. Please, Jana. Uh, a request to all speakers, please try to keep to five minutes. I will uh, show you when it is three and one minute left. Okay. No, seven minutes, sorry. Five. Not, not five, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted now, to get you awake. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I can still say good morning. It's still before lunch. Yeah, thank you very much for having me speak here today. Um, before I start my presentation on a local level monitoring coalition that we are currently building, let me, um, yeah, let me tell you it is not just a Caritas presentation that I'm holding. Um, next to working for Caritas Switzerland as the DRA focal point, I'm also a core member of a platform that's called the Swiss NGO DRR platform, obviously working on DRR and climate change. And we are also a member of the GNDR, the Global Network of Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Reduction. And this presentation, I call it a joint presentation because the whole initiative is a joint one. Would I have to click? Should be this one, huh? <laughs> yeah. So I start by a small quote that any effort to reduce the vulnerability of people and strengthen their resilience must start or must begin at the local level, to quote former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Um, why am I saying this? Why is local level monitoring for risk reduction, um, why is it important? And why, um, why am I speaking here as, um, yeah, as representative of the Swiss NGO DRR platform? Um, the, the, the past, um, the past uh, framework for disaster risk reduction, the Yogo Framework of Action, um, from 2005 to 2015, was a very important step in risk reduction. It was monitored at the national level. A lot of progress was being made in terms of preparedness, in terms of response capacities. But what was highlighted in also the official monitorings, but particularly in, pre in publications such as these, was that the underlying risk factors were not addressed, that, um, um, that local, that national level capacities do not necessarily translate to the local level, and that more than 90% of damages are actually not caused by the large scale disasters. And I'm not talking about insured losses and damages, I'm talking about damages to, to small-scale houses, et cetera, of the, of the people, mainly in developing countries, underreported and unreported events. Um, and the, that they cause a lot of damage and they are not featured. So these publications um, were developed by the Global Network for Civil Society Organizations um, uh, for Disaster Reduction. They're called Frontline or Views from the Frontline. And they were like a shadow reporting to the um, Yoga Framework of Action they highlighted this relevance of the extensive disaster risk, the existing gap between national policies, uh, plans, and then local level capacities, um, the lack of means for implementation, and the need for citizen-generated data. So basically, people are 
people at the front line get a voice, have a voice to speak. Um, the Yoga Framework of Action was in 2015 followed by the Sender Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And the Sendai framework acknowledges clearly that um, local level governments and communities are a key part of bringing risk reduction forward. And this is certainly a big step, and I would also say it is partly acknowledged to the work that has been done by GNDR. So we, as a Swiss NGO DRR platform, together with GNDR, wanted to make use of that current, let's say, favorite a uh, favorable environment. Um, UNISDR invited us um, to partner and to contribute to the official Sendai monitor, uh, which is going to start in the coming months. And views from the front line seemed like a good tool because it's still the largest independent global review of disaster risk reduction locally. So over these past reviews, over 85,000 stakeholders in 129 countries participated. And data was generated that reflects their perceptions of risks of resilience and also the barriers that they are faced to, um, to increase um, resilience. Um, so when we talk about um, livelihood resilience or about I'm just wanting to, wanted to link it to the session topic. Um, this monitoring initiative that we found that inclusive risk governance is basically at the basis of the climate community, community the disaster community, maybe also the fragility and conflict community that all work on resilience. And inclusive risk governance may be the, um, the missing link or maybe like the, the common denominator that, uh, that we all need to address. So when we met, in the, uh, when we met this July, GNDR, Swiss NGO DRR platform, and 30 other um, international organizations from uh, Europe, North America, um, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, um, we were talking about how can we bring the action, uh, the data that we generate, how can we bring it to action? And how can we work, f how can we further um, work on the views from the front line to make it an um, even more powerful tool that could contribute to the official low, um, to the official Sendai monitoring, so shedding light on what is the progress on disaster risk reduction and resilience building, but also provide an additional evidence base to hold official reports accountable. So to challenge reports, are you really, uh, are you really giving the information that reflects what's happening on the ground? The information should not only be, this, um, should not only be um, extractive, but inform local strategies, policies, and plans. Um, the monitoring or the, the frontline initiative um, builds on information from at-risk people, governments, authorities, and civil societies through structured interviews and structured conversations. Uh, after a first rollout in 2018 in Tonga and the Philippines, which is, which is, which is funded by the Australian government, um, the initiative is going to target f 48 more countries, so in total 50 countries, um, with an, uh, with, uh, an estimated um, yeah, funding of um, 5 million uh, US dollars from the European Union. So we plan to roll this out until the next global platform for DRR in 2019. Why am I presenting this here? Very quickly, in 20 seconds, I guess, we need you. Like, we are 30 organizations at the moment meeting, a lot, mostly coming from the DRR community. ICAT was also present, SEI was also present, but most organizations were from the DRR community. But we need more partners, we need more knowledge resources to uh, develop the methodology, to have a strong and representative data set. Uh, to act as knowledge brokers and also to implement the pilot in Tonga and the Philippines. But of course also for the rollout um, to connect the different agendas to implement the, the rollout and um, to advocate on, um, yeah, on the different global platforms for uh, this endeavor. 
So these are the organizations that so far have, um, have signed the coalition agreement. We are still in the finalization process. So you can see there are also some organizations that you already saw in other presentations, like the Global Resilience Partnership, uh, ICAD, um, we had Stockholm Envi Environment Institute, as I already said. So why to get engaged? It's a powerful initiative. And I think we can really bring the perspective of people that are at risk, that are at, fr at the front line to the global fora to really strengthen the point that risk reduction and resilience building starts at the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jana, for the description of this exciting initiative. I think you are addressing a big concern, at least I know, for you and ISDR. So, uh, and, uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions on uh, the specific implementation, which we will happy to take uh, later on. Thank you very much again. We are now changing uh, themes completely, or maybe not so completely, but we're coming to, to uh, safer, safer schools. Uh, Vishal uh, Patak uh, studied social work and uh, is a consultant to the All India uh, Disaster uh, Mitigation Institute, ADMI. Uh, he's also a core member uh, of the ADMI, uh, looking uh, or working or leading a program uh, for uh, increase of uh, safety in schools. Yes. Please, Vishal. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, all this learning is coming from the community. Um, they are the main source of all these efforts uh, jointly together, where we are seeing school not as a only about the educational center or uh, for students, but it is also about linking um, community and schools to build resilience. Well, uh, this is maybe not only about the India where unsafe schools are a reality, but it is if we consider DRR, if we consider climate change, if we consider security point of view, then it is a global issue. Maybe the intensity is different, but it is must be required to be addressed. Uh, and uh, school is being one of very, very, very strong platform to do this all the research, pilot, uh, and real implementation, whatever our learning uh, from different programs. Um, but however, since if we look uh, since HFA time frame, it is recognized, number one. Number two, there are many pilots has been implemented uh, globally in developing countries, but still it is need to do a lot of work to link safe schools with to build community resilience. Uh, this is what, based on the HFA, and now uh, we all are emphasizing on how to implementing lo locally Sunday framework or implementing NDC, where school is an important tool. It is really now becoming comprehensive school safety and security, but still it is a concept, and we need to promote more and more stronger implementation for this. So there is a huge area of overlapping, and uh, uh, there are many pilots has been done uh, that builds our understanding of disaster risks, uh, also about the green school concept, and also about building security within school, and how safe school can be a uh, tool for encouraging for community resilience area locally. Uh, well, uh, little bit about the background of our institution. Uh, uh, we initiated this work in 1988-89, repeated drought in one of state of uh, India. But later on, during 2001 earthquake, we have found that uh, this needs to be addressed, uh, school safety issue. So we have started uh, um, working with children and com uh, school communities which is now expanded to many uh, states and uh, syst more systematically through Safer School campaign. Well, um, as said, this is, uh, there are many 
school safety efforts uh, which limited to students and school communities but uh, during our last uh, seven to eight years we have found that uh, school is not only about the uh, making school and education safer but it is also about building back better linking more and more co with the communities either through uh, using micro insurance to reach out community either through cash for work uh, either through cash for work either through any long-term recovery efforts that has been seen to through different pilots But this engagement of this school community is not easy. It is a very long process. We have started through informing schools and then after making them partner in our actions and uh, consulting them. So it's really uh, challenging, but on the other side, it is very joyful learning. And it is a very long-term process to engaging them and linking with the school, uh, resilient and safer school. Well, in terms of resilience and in terms of uh, loss and damage linkages, this is a, a very good opportunity uh, that school is providing a platform to, um, and also said uh, uh, in the court by case that uh, um, loss and damage as well as resilience uh, very broad, but on the other side, without local actions, uh, uh, we may not have complete understanding of loss and damage. So far it's mostly limited with the concept, but if we want to have complete picture, then school is the one platform, very strong platform for having better and better understanding of loss and damage as well as in resilience. Um, another one point is uh, private sector role in uh, safe education and building resilience including risk transfer and insurance where schools role is also very big because uh, not only uh, the role of children is already identified but on the other side uh, how to link safe schools as a tool for community resilience is needs to be further attention. Yeah, this is also important because uh, since last uh, two, uh, two decades, we have been DRR communities working separately and climate change adaptation communities working separately, but now this is bringing more and more further uh, closer integration where uh, loss and damage uh, is really uh, important theme that brings together where if we see that concept locally, then school is the one platform. Thank you so much in a short, very short. Thank you very much, uh, Vishal. I think uh, uh, the, the role and the problems of children in disaster risk management and resilience is uh, still often a bit underestimated uh, uh, factor. And I think uh, uh, you, you addressed an extremely important theme. Moreover, uh, when we want to increase and, and reach global resilience, I think we need well-educated people, and all people need to be educated, so uh, safer schools are at the basis of, uh, of it all, I think. Uh, we come to the third one. Uh, Vivek uh, Brassat on food security, resilience, and livelihood, I think with a special focus on, on Africa. Uh, Vivek has a, has, a, has a PhD in uh, environmental science from George uh, Mason University here uh, in the region. He's still uh, teaching and doing research at George Mason University on, on climate change and resilience, but he's also a consultant to the World Bank. Please, uh, Vivek, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, I was expe expecting to get more time because today I'm talking about Africa. <laughs> Africa is not a country, it's a <laughs> continent. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure. <laughs> you should have told me before. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to remind myself that I'm talking about a, country, uh, a continent and there are uh, more than uh, 55 uh, uh, countries. It's very diverse uh, economically, uh, ethnically, uh, historically. And it's a very interesting place. 
And also, uh, uh, one thing I would like to uh, share with you uh, that uh, um, uh, this is uh, this research or presentation is based on secondary literature, so I won't claim <laughs> anything <laughs> that this is mine. Uh, everything is coming from Google. So that is also I wanted to make sure that things are available in public domain. And uh, uh, yesterday I was uh, in a uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, at Capitol Hill, and there was a big discussion about how do you how do you take knowledge and convert into policy piece because policy makers they don't have time you know they have maybe 10 minutes time to understand what we are talking about so i thought let's experiment with <laughs> that knowledge and do something interesting so this is overnight production uh, in india we call it a uh, uh, one day cricket match so it's kind of one day <laughs> so i'll see how it goes <laughs> so this is a big number i wanted to share with you uh, in africa now uh, 2010 agriculture and food uh, sector was 3.13 billion uh, dollars because we love talking about dollars so I wanted to put some number here and it is expected in 2030 it will grow and it will become one trillion or maybe more so it's a big number to think about uh, in terms of what is happening in Africa and that has a lot of implication to uh, food security and employment and job around uh, agriculture and food uh, this is also one interesting piece I wanted to share with you. Uh, if you look at uh, Africa, it looks green, more or less green. And there is a huge uh, youth bulge going on, and average age is around 20. So when you have a lot of youth, you have a lot of aspiration, a lot of dream, a lot of uh, new ways of doing things. So we have to look at how youth would respond to the issues we are talking about. And if you look at numbers uh, I, I pulled out, uh, we have... 364 million African between 15 to 35 age, 1 to 12 million coming every year in workforce, and 60% are unemployed or working in informal sector. So that's a very challenging number we have. If you look at uh, uh, average age of farmers is around 60, so that raises a big question, who will be providing food for us? next year or probably after 10 years. So we have to start thinking about. And this is not happening in Africa. This is happening in many other parts of the world. I looked at uh, uh, average age of uh, farmers in the US. It was 62 years. So that's a very, very you know, uh, uh, critical number to think about who would be producing food uh, in next uh, 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 generation. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, num uh, the land, Africa has 65% of all the arable land left over in the world, and that can produce enough food for uh, future. But there is a big question. Food import bill of Africa is 3.5, uh, uh, 35.4 billion in 2015. And that tells us the story of how uh, food security and food deficit is, is playing out in Africa. So it's a very contrasting number if you think of. I also uh, uh, looked at what is happening in terms of climate change vulnerability, and there are a lot of reports available. And it's all relative number, it's all relative perception and, and assessment. But if you look at map of Africa or African countries, it's a daunting. It's, it, it, climate change impact is, uh, is, is relatively more, and there are many uh, societal, political, economic reasons to it. We heard about you know concepts and uh, practices around vulnerability. So vulnerability is there. And you can look at you know what is happening uh, in terms of global uh, 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 scale. A similar uh, figure we have on food security. So if you look at Africa, most of the countries, or uh, at least the uh, northern countries, are facing extreme uh, level of food uh, food insecurity, and that is also a big challenge. So you see a lot of potentials there, but at the same time, a lot of challenges uh, uh, upcoming based on climate change, based on the way we are. So I'll go very fast. Uh, this is what is happening in Africa. Uh, because when we look at a, a food, uh, uh, food sector or agriculture sector, we think about cereal. But there are a lot of diversification happening. And that is happening in many other uh, sectors like vegetable, like, like uh, 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 fruit, meat, egg, poultry, dairy. Every, everywhere you'll find diversification happening. Uh, similarly, uh, there is a, a agriculture value chain emerging, and you have a lot of uh, processes, a lot of steps, a lot of you know small segments that can provide a lot of opportunities and employment for our bulging youth. Uh, this is the number I generated uh, based on various sources, and if you look at a farmer's participation in higher-level value chain, 
they are participating in a very, very meager number, very low number. And uh, these are few examples. I, I have more numbers from various other countries. And you can see it's around 1% or less than 1% small farmers are participating in agriculture value chain. So this is also a big challenge we have if we think of uh, 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 what would be the future of uh, Africa and how would you include uh, farmers and make them happy, make them uh, uh, good in what they are doing. So there are some uh, examples. I was trying to understand what is happening you know, in the middle of everything. So I'll go quickly. Uh, I, I, I thought this would be one interesting way to look at what is happening in Africa. And this is, again, based on my meta-analysis. So there are four uh, big trends emerging. Uh, the first one is job and employment is happening in food and agriculture sector through informal and uh, form formal SMEs, small and medium enterprise. Social enterprise is also happening. It's becoming very hot these days. Skill and agripreneur. I'm, uh, I'm trying to use what uh, African Development Bank has used. Agripreneurs is also uh, emerging very fast, and a lot of aggregation happening on small level. So I have a few examples. For example, this one, and this is very challenging to think about. In, in Kenya, a lot of farmers, they left cereal production, and they moved to f they move to uh, floriculture. So this is transformation in my mind. And you can look at the number, you know, how many people are involved, how much money they are making, and how much export they are doing. You know? And uh, I just read an article, and it says that every day, Nairobi sends one chartered plane of uh, cut flower to Amsterdam. And that's a very, very you know, interesting and very uh, 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 similar thing is happening in, in, in Utopia also. And you can see uh, m farmers are moving out of normal agriculture and going to different directions. And this is one of the examples. And there are many clusters emerging like this for, for mango, for pineapple, for you know, fruits, vegetable, egg, chicken. So there are many economic uh, uh, opportunities and uh, clusters emerging. And interestingly, they are not supported by any multilateral agencies or NGO. It's all organically developing in various parts of the uh, of various parts of Africa. And I also looked at what is happening in social enterprise uh, space. I remember uh, yesterday Beth was talking. So there are a lot of scope in thinking about PPP, private, public, and uh, 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 private, public, and what's the third one? Partnership. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to quiz you, actually. <laughs> 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 yeah. You know, yeah, because this is kind of lunch time, so I thought let's. <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, Hello Tractor. Uh, this is basically one guy from the US, uh, Jehiel Oliver. I have in interacti interacted with him many times. Uh, so what he did, he went to Nigeria, and he thought there are a lot of farmers, they're not doing agriculture because of not having tractor. So he took concept of Uber and applied in tractor because farmers, they don't need tractor every day. You know, they need like five to 10 days in a year. So it's Uber of tractor, you know, track. So you can think of, you know, uh, Uber version of tractor. So this is happening. And, and, and we have to think about how to, how to understand what he's doing and how to help him so he can upscale his, his uh, work. There are many other examples, like digital green. If you Google digital green, you'll find many uh, farmers there putting their own work, the best practices they are doing in YouTube. And I just did a, a Google search, and I found 3,000 videos. Farmers they themselves are producing, just like American Idol. You know, They want to portray themselves in videos. So they are doing, and they're producing, they're processing, and they're putting in YouTube. So you can find a lot of best practices uh, farmers themselves are recording for themselves, and, and, and you can see all these. ICAO, I'll go very quickly, similar example. So you have ICT application in dairy industry, small farmers are doing that. Now I'll go to some agripreneur one, like this is interesting example, hydroponics, urban agriculture, and this is happening in many cities in, in Africa. You go to Accra, you go to Nairobi, and this is one of the very interesting example. Uh, uh, Angela Arjela, she won a World Economic Forum. Uh, for best uh, female innovator, and she is doing hydroponics, and she has also developed value chain uh, uh, along along the line. So, uh, in conclusion, I would say in Africa there are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of potentials also. A lot of transformations happening. A lot of good things are happening, but we need to know where they are, what they are doing, and we need to support them so they can be part of transformation and resilience. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Vivek, for this uh, vivid view on, on, a, on a combination of disturbing and exciting initiative this uh, continent has. I'm, I'm sure you generated a lot of questions then. Uh, but before uh, we come to these questions, last but, uh, last but not least, Amy uh, Quant. Uh, she's a, a research professor at, as I understand, Arizona State University, but uh, her main project being uh, uh, located at the University of Colorado. You may explain it in, in more detail. Uh, it is the project on uh, land potential knowledge system where you are uh, the global leader. Please, Amy, mm -hmm. the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. So not Arizona State University, New Mexico State University, um, but I'm actually based out of the University of Colorado in Boulder because our team is split. Um, the Land Potential Knowledge System Project is actually this is a great transition because I'm going to talk about one specific um, kind of tech intervention in the agricultural sector. Um, and what we're doing is creating a kind of a suite of mobile apps to help people make more sustainable land management choices. So using tech to get information into the hands of people um, that need it, basically. There's a whole team, there's probably about 15 folks involved in this project. Most of them are much smarter than myself. Um, sorry, you have to listen to me today, but I'm gonna outline kind of what our apps are doing, where we're going in the future, and how this relates to livelihood resilience. Um, so right now, we have t one, it's really one app with two different modules, Land Info, which is a soil identification app, and Land Cover, which is for vegetation monitoring. Um, our app, you can find it for I iPhone or for Android if you just go into the Google Play Store and search Land PKS. It's totally free to download, totally free to use, everything's open source, open access, which is obviously really important. Um, we are looking to the future, and we're going to add some more tools kind of to the Land PKS toolkit. Um, so one of these is a crop monitor app, um, a soil health app, biomass monitor, and then body condition score for monitoring livestock. So I'll briefly just cover the, the modules that we have right now. So Land Info helps provide site-specific soil information. So this is obviously really important when it comes to agriculture. So you need to know what kind of soil you have. Do you have a clay soil? Does your soil have a lot of sand or silt? And these kind of things can help you make more, more resilient livelihood choices as far as what to plant, what kind of erosion, uh, mitigation practices, things like that. Um, so what the app actually does is walk users through how to hand texture the soil. Has anyone here ever done that before, hand textured the soil? Oh, there's a few hands. That's pretty good. It's really fun. You should definitely try it. Um, so the point of this is to allow a user who's not a soil scientist, who maybe has, you know, maybe they're a farmer and have experience working in their land, but they don't really know the specifics about how to determine what kind of soil that they have. Um, so the picture in the middle, it's a little dark, that's um, an agricultural extension agent in Tanzania that I worked with a little bit this past July. Um, and she really thought this was... Excellent, because it's her job to go around to, I think she had 3,000 different farmers she's working with, quite a few, and try to make recommendations and help them out and help them solve problems or whatever kind of things they need help with. Um, and having this really nice tool for her will help her pretty much do her job better. Um, she told me that to get, now if she wants to get any information about soils, anything like that, she has to go all the way to the district headquarters and talk to a soil scientist, which is something that... I mean, she was very motivated, but she was probably not going to do. So this helps put that power in her hands. Um, and then the picture on the right, that's actually a farmer that we ran through the app with. And just kind of emphasize how we're trying to make these apps usable for a wide variety of users. He was pretty amazed that we could determine what kind of soil he had just using a phone. Um, it's pretty different for him. <coughs> so this is the land info module. And then, oh wait, no, I'll keep going. So here's a good example. Um, so this is in a uh, part of Tanzania. We dug three different soil pits. Um, this is pretty small spatial scale, maybe about 100 meters. Um, and the thing with soil is that a lot of people don't know, um, and I've just recently learned, is that they vary significantly across the landscape, especially in places, this is actually kind of a hilly area in Tanzania. Um, so the lower field versus the upper field versus the forest were actually really different. Um, so one of the outputs that you get, or one of the results that users get from using our app, is available water holding capacity. This is really important for determining what kind of crops you can plant. Um, so you can see even if you just jump across the road from the lower field to the upper field, 
the amount of water that the soil can have varies. Um, so the farmer on the upper field might want to change their agricultural practices or make them different than the farmer on the lower field as far as what types of crops they're planting um, and what kind of other soil and water um, conservation practices. And then in the forest here, you can see the, the water holding capacity was much smaller even there, which is a good illustration of how leaving um, that is forest is probably the best um, option. It's not as agriculturally productive as the two other plots. All right, so the other um, module we have right now is called land cover. And this is pretty different. It's being used for vegetation monitoring, mostly in Namibia and in Kenya and the rangeland areas there. And it takes a fairly already established protocol as far as monitoring the vegetation and puts it on a mobile app. So you go through the mobile app, you can click on the different types of vegetation. You don't need really any other tools except for a stick, which that gentleman's holding up. Um, it's a point intercept kind of vegetation monitoring. So you put the stick down, there are five points. What kind of vegetation are touching those five points? Um, and this is important for monitoring rangeland. So pretend, p possibly you're monitoring invasive species, making sure that they're not growing, um, or for increasing fodder species as well. So that can help increase the resilience of pastoralists. If the rangeland has been restored effectively, um, they're gonna be more resilient to drought. Um, yeah. So some of the benefits, um, like I said, it's free to download, free to use. You don't actually need to have, um, yeah, some of the results are delivered to the phone. Um, some automatically and some you actually do need a data connection. So if you are collecting data or in the field, you don't need it to actually collect that data, but you might need to go back and get network connection or, you know, cell service to actually get some of the results because there's fancy math I don't understand that happens in the cloud. Um, but yeah, if you're in a rural place, you can still run through Land PKS with people. Uh, it's open source data, so we do have a data portal on our website, landpotential.org. So you can go there and look at all the plots that have been dug for Land PKS or all the plots that have been done. Um, and we eventually want to turn this into a sharing uh, mechanism. So farmers or people that are on similar land, similar climates can kind of share what they're doing. Um, and this, yeah, like I said, we're giving people who previously haven't had access to this type of information access to it through mobile phones. So just to, to end, um, put the, our, ad, our my email address and then our kind of email address up there as well as the website. Um, we're always looking for collaborators. This is not a project that is owned by us. We want to develop it and have it used by as many people as possible, adopted by as many organizations and groups as possible. So we're always looking for collaborators. So please, yeah, just talk to me during lunch or get a hold of me at some other point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for uh, concluding uh, what I think is a very exciting panorama of different uh, aspects of livelihood resilience. I think it's really uh, truly about lively, livelihood resilience, uh, uh, all of the four talks. Uh, I would have a whole list, list of questions to all of you, but I'm sure the audience has as well, and I would not lose any time to uh, start including the audience now. Uh, who has a question or a comment? Please identify yourself. We have also uh, uh, people remotely connected, and I uh, think they are happy to know who, who is speaking, because we partly know each other. Yeah, over there. We are taking three questions. Please, if possible, uh, uh, identify uh, the person uh, who might ask the question. <coughs> uh, others might have answers as well. Okay, my name is Dr. Uh, Ashikur Rahman. I'm from University of South Florida. So I have two questions, one from Vivek and another one for Amy. So uh, to Vivek, so from your presentation, we came to know that the average age for the farmers in Africa is 60, but most of the people, they are you know, young. So can we infer that the number of farmers is decreasing day by day? And I was wondering, what is their mechanism of knowledge transfer? Do they transfer their knowledge to their offspring, or how do people become farmers? That's the question to Dibek. Uh, and to Amy, so in terms of the land use and your the, um, program, I was wondering, do they have 
access to the internet or is it easy to get access to the internet? Thank you. Uh, you had also a question to Amy. Can, can yeah, you ask? I, I put well? a question for Amy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so ah, yeah, this yeah. one. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, maybe I'll take the first question uh, because that was directed to me. Uh, very interesting question, and I was trying to point out, but I didn't have time. So that's a major challenge because farmers age is aging, and youth are not interested, you know, because they're moving away. They're living maybe in rural setting, but they're not doing or they're not interested, I would say, because that agriculture, the traditional agriculture is no more attractive to them. And th this is coming again and again in various reports and blog and news. <coughs> so definitely that whole knowledge transfer or uh, local knowledge transfer or, or traditional knowledge transfer from one generation to another generation is a challenge. And uh, when I look at that challenge, I was talking about that whole so social enterprise paradigm emerging in that context. So maybe the new way to attract them back would be, you know, provide them new tools, like they're into mobile technology and phone and apps and, you know, a lot of other uh, technology that is emerging around. So it's a very disruptive, you know, for to our mind also, uh, sometimes we, we, we feel kind of challenged, you know, uh, is it the right way to go? But that is the, w that is the way things are happening on ground. So maybe uh, uh, just building on that, and helping them understand, like, you know, like the, I was using that example of uh, green agri or digital green. So they might, they might act, I'm not promoting any NGO or any uh, social enterprise, but I'm just thinking about the approach. So one approach would be recording or kind of, you know, doc documenting what experienced farmers are doing and, and converting into some sort of electronic library that can be used locally or that can be you know, transferred electronically using uh, YouTube or many other uh, platforms. So, so there are ways. So we have to think about what what was happening versus what is happening and what can be done. You know. So definitely, challenge is there on on knowledge exchange part, on education part, especially the type of education you are talking about. But there are ways. We have to start thinking about how ICT and youth uh, can play a bigger role in this uh, context. Do you have any idea why they are not interested on agriculture? Because it's manual. The young generation. It's very manual. Th first thing, what I have read, as I said, you know, this was my uh, one-day game. I just do, did the whole presentation overnight. So <laughs> I, can <laughs> I can give you a lot of citations I have on, on my slide. But what I can remember, uh, what I can think of, the, w the, big, but the big point that is coming up again and again, and that is uh, uh, it's manual, you know, and also th their aspiration. They look at their own colleague. They look at their own fa friend. They are doing something different, and they don't want to do agriculture, you know. So I'm using your anthropological lens. It's about dream. It's about aspiration. They want. They want. Don't want to see themselves as you know their as their parents, uh, parents or uh, uh, whoever has struggled in their village. So they want to do different things, you know. They want to to enjoy what they are doing, and they want to extract pride out of it, you know. So there are a lot of identity issues also along with agriculture. So I think uh, maybe that is one reason or big reason. Uh, profitability is also one reason, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's all, mm, it's a mixture actually, you know. The whole identity issue, uh, profitability issue, recognition, everything is kind of playing a role in that. That's maybe a uh, discussion that uh, can be continued over, over lunch, a very interesting one, I think, Amy. Yeah, um, access to the internet is a challenge for some users and a barrier to adoption of these kind of mobile technologies. So we have a wide variety of users, kind of the more educated one would be researchers are using land PKS. So they obviously don't have that same barrier. Um, from the places I've been in Tanzania and in Kenya testing out land PKS, if you have an internet, ac uh, internet accessible phone, be it a smartphone or kind of the next version down, I guess. Um, and you have a cell service, you do have access to the internet, but paying for um, MBs or paying for that access can be a barrier as well. Um, there's also not that many people, not that many farmers, I would say, in Tanzania that have smartphones. Um, so we've kind of shift our focus in the last few months from farmers directly to extension agents who have kind of the next step up in education and access to technology. Um, so that is, that's definitely a barrier. But the way, how I see it, the way the world's going, there's just going to be an increased adoption of smartphones. So these, these kind of interventions will only catch on more and more, mm -hmm. hopefully. <laughs> next question, a bit more to the background this time. Uh, yeah, 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 just where you are, yes. <laughs> 
thank you for the opportunity. I'm Dennis Opio from Kenya, Maseno University. I have a comment for Vivek. In regard to your comment about floriculture, I would like to note that it is a very complex uh, mm -hmm. sector where in Kenya it is dominated by multinational corporations rather than small scale uh, or local farmers. So the image portrayed may not reflect the reality on the ground. And two, in regard to challenges to agriculture, my take is that the main problem, just as you have tried to explain, is attitude. The youth have a very negative attitude towards agriculture, particularly in regard to their lives, their lives in the rural areas, their aspirations, and so on and so forth. This is also complicated by maybe lack of skill sets, lack of capital, and lack of enabling policies. So maybe the way forward to address adoption of agriculture is to put in place mechanisms to promote attitude change. Because if we have people with a negative attitude, no matter how much money is pumped into that sector, in no matter what level of trading and so on and so forth, nothing will happen. So we need maybe measures, initiatives, and so on to portray a positive image of agriculture. And in Kenya today, uh, the mass media, particularly the leading, the three leading newspapers, have uh, sections in their newspapers uh, called Green Goal, trying to promote and disseminate information on positive outcomes from small-scale agriculture in urban and rural areas using uh, ICT and so on and so forth. So these are some of the issues that can be considered. Thank you. Do you want to comment on yeah, shortly so if possible? Yeah, so I, I'll take your first question because uh, the second question you answered, I hope you answered yourself. So thank you for uh, your insight on the second question. So I'll take your first question. Uh, uh, definitely, I agree that uh, there is a, uh, uh, like uh, farmers or small farmers are not participating in that big business. Corporates are de dominating. And if you look at one of the slides when I was talking about farmers' participation in agriculture value chain, or especially higher level value chain, it was around one or two percent. So that's, that's ca well captured uh, with the data whatever was available in secondary uh, uh, literature. So I was able to look at that, you know, and I'm trying to, uh, understand how we can take small farmers, those who are into production, whatever type of production or community they're doing, and kind of move them, help them move them up. So they can, they can make more benefit and they can be part of inclusive agri agriculture value chain. So that's there, you know, that, that's a challenge. And, <coughs> and, and the slide I was presenting on uh, low, very low participation of small farmers in agriculture value chain was directing towards the comment you are raising. So I accept that, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to take questions for Vishal and Jana. One here, is there one from the back? Okay. Thank you, uh, Brad Powers. I'm a PhD student from Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, for my questions for Vishal. Um, I wonder if you could comment, often, progressive strategies come in conflict with other progressive strategies. So in your work pushing resilience in school, or have you come in conflict with other school reform issues that they want money and resources to push their agenda versus resilience? Is there conflict with allies in a sense? And is that a problem? Sorry, say it again. Is there a with allies, so you're pushing resilience and there might be education reform for say, girls or for better, uh, you know, I, I don't want to name what the issues might be, but some, I'm just wondering if you come in conflict with other progressive uh, agendas as you're pushing resilience in school. And the answer might be no, so don't overthink it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, sure. Um, 
No, uh, it is really, <laughs> it is really mainstreaming area where, which is linking with each and every action, but just lacking of it needs stronger yeah. implementation. A question for Jana. Uh, if if not for the moment, this gives me the opportunity. We have one. to ask you a question. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, I didn't see you. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, George Clark, a geographer and librarian at Harvard University. Jana, uh, when you were talking, I was hoping that you would have more time to talk about um, the sort of underreported small scale events. Um, could you say a little bit about what they are and um, your vision for how they might be incorporated into frameworks for reporting and so on? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, these events are mostly very local events, rather frequent events. So when you talk about return periods, it would be less than 30 years. So it, it might be annual events that happen that still cause certain damages that are not considered a disaster. When you look at the global databases like MDOT, for example, where they have certain criteria, what um, categorizes as a disaster, um, but who cause, uh, but which cause damage and and considerable losses and livelihood disruptions for the people that are being that are being affected. So um, that ranges from agricultural losses um, to disruption in, in access to, to villages, so ac disruptions in livelihood um, generation. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's rather these smaller events that are unreported that do not even make it to national newspapers, but maybe just be uh, yeah, shared and happen un unreported. And the front line or views from the front line through their um, very special structure. So the GNDR is a network of a number of very local community-based civil society organizations across, well, I'm not sure how many countries, but um, Sarah, do you know exactly how many countries they work in? It's I, I can look it up, but if you if you look, go to their website, they're basically on every continent, and they have a very wide range of organizations they work with. So they work locally, and through conducting these interviews, uh, focus group discussions uh, with local um, government representatives and uh, community representatives, um, they were able to to check back how what happened locally, how that was also reflected or whether it was also reflected in the larger databases and there was a clear mismatch. Further questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, Beth Talman, Arizona State University. So another question for Jana, now that you're talking about this underreporting of disasters. So I work a lot, as you know, with satellites and flood mapping. Mm -hmm. How are, are you using sort of the satellite record to leverage measuring crop loss for floods, fires, and other events? And do you see that playing into some of these monitoring? Mm -hmm. So when I speak re increasing reporting, under reporting. Okay. Yeah. So when I when I speak about that initiative, um, we are currently in the process of reframing it. So to report f to to the Sendai framework. And so far, um, to my knowledge, views from the front line has not been using satellite data and available remote sensing data to um, yeah also to to check to have like a like a checks and balance system of the um, of the qualitative information that they would get from from the interviews and when we are talking about integrating the information that we generate through that monitoring initiative uh, into the global monitoring framework um, of the Sendai monitor, then certainly this even becomes more more of a question. Um, we we do not. Mm, so I think in 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 DR also in 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 very in the local municipality village based level, um, using satellite data is is possible has been has been tested i mean also in humanitarian response where you can basically very well cover uh, flood extent 
Um, for example, or also in the earth, uh, Nepal earthquake, where basically landslide hot uh, landslide spots were identified and that triggered direct response. Um, but in in terms of inclusion into our framework, no, it's not yet at that point. But very happy to maybe um, discuss with you further, since you are being really at the front line on developing such uh, such tools. That's one of the purposes of sitting together here. So, uh, a further question uh, in the background. Yeah. Two. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Clive Mutunga. I work for USID in Washington DC. I got a comment for Vivek and a comment for both Vivek and Amy. I think we, uh, in terms of agriculture and youth uh, participation in agriculture, we also need to recognize the. Uh, one of the important uh, factors of production, you, you don't have access to land, and um, the land is owned by their 60-year-old parents and grandparents, and uh, trying to think of ways of how youth can access land as a factor of production is critical. And then for both, I, I would like to hear about climate services. We know that uh, to, in, uh, to really uh, promote resilience for farming and farming practices. Farmers need to access climate data and information to make their daily uh, choices. And I would be interested to hear what that looks like in some of the social enterprises that Vivek mentioned and the, the land uh, apps that uh, Amy uh, has been working on. Thank you. So for land PKS, there are some results that you get automatically. You do enter a GPS point, and it gives you climate information right away. So that's one of the first results you get, um, temperatures and rainfall data. It's not, we're trying to improve it so it's a little more real time. Right now it's just monthly averages, um, but that's one of the pieces of information we're delivering to folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh Thank you, Clive, uh, for a very interesting question uh, on application of ICT in knowledge access and uh, especially in relation to climate change. Uh, maybe you are talking about early warning system or agriculture advisory. So uh, 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 the information I gathered uh, in my slide, and there are many examples, uh, is basically sitting with USAID <laughs> report, actually. So I'll, I'll <laughs> share with you uh, uh, USAID report. You work with them, and they have done a very good job uh, collecting a lot of you know examples that is happening in Africa, not only in, uh, in climate space or early warning space, in other issues also. For example, what is happening in production space, what is happening in processing space, marketing, you know, uh, financial, finance access, what type of you know, uh, uh, land record system is available. So there are many, uh, even uh, like uh, soil mo moisture meter, so there are cereal uh, moisture meter. So there are many uh, social enterprise uh, developing around these uh, questions uh, we have been struggling for a long time. And uh, USAID has created very good database on that. And innovate in agriculture, that's the big report uh, uh, I recently went through. And that also captures a lot of innovations that is happening in this space. But the big question is, how do you identify them? How do you screen who are good ones to go forward? How do you help them? How do you nurture? How do you mainstream in programming? How do you mainstream in policy? How do you bring them in, in, in radar? You know, these are some big questions we have. And still, I don't have very good answers. So we need to have very good kind of understanding of what we need to do in terms of back-end engineering to bring them in, in light, because I, I myself uh, uh, um, is trying with two or three uh, entrepreneurs to help them, you know, and, and and I have organized their talk, like brown bag lunch, and and now I see some results, but it's still it's still it's very hard, you know. So uh, uh, so how do you how do you bring them in mainstream, and how do you uh, get best advantage of whatever they are doing on ground is a critical question for us. So I was going to stop, but we have been given 10 more minutes by, Ma um, uh, by Roger Mark, so thank you very much. And uh, we have space for uh, more questions. I think there was David. Uh. My name is David Rothwell from Oregon State University. My question is for Vivek and Amy about this um, emergence of a data architecture. Oh, sorry, I, sh I should say infrastructure has emerged around us in the last, say, decade 
that we've barely be, be, been aware of. We think we, we depend on uh, data that exists in a cloud and analytical tools for processing these data, such as Google Maps and Facebook and uh, information products that order the way we, we build and think. And one of the big problems is inequities in this data infrastructure globally. Yeah. Um, and, and secondly, that <clears throat> these data are concentrated in private hands. And um, we can think about the way these would lead to large scale transformations, et cetera, and you've identified this. And I'm just wondering, what sorts of guidelines do we need? What sort of, what's the, what ought to be the policy approaches to thinking of this data infrastructure that's increasingly important? I'll take a second question in order to be as effective as possible. I think, uh, in, yeah. Thank you, Brian Greenberg, and I'm an independent consultant, and uh, first wanted to thank the panel for some really interesting presentations, and Roger Mark for extending here. It's always exciting when you're in overtime and get extra time to play the game. I guess, <coughs> excuse me, my question is, <coughs> I'm sorry for the panel, ac across the panel, is really perhaps how to pull Yana's perspective closer together with Amy's and Vivek's, and Vishal, not leaving you out here, maybe you could respond if you see a relevance, but one of the important things we're trying to grapple here is a sense that especially for smallholders going forward, it's, we're not playing the game of traditional agriculture as usual. We are operating in it with much higher uncertainty and variability and risk and vulnerability for them so that we are not in a situation, for example, of simply necessarily identifying value chains and market demands and endorsing floriculture for export, nor are we simply in the game in many places, and I see important contributions for what you're talking about, but one of the things that is going to make agriculture more appealing for smallholder poor farmers and for a new generation is a sense that they don't have to embrace the risk and uncertainty uh, for their investment of, of, of money and labor. And so in, if you will, the mainstream development strategies with which Vivek nicely underscored and Amy, I'm wondering what you do when you see climate change overtaking traditional paradigms of crop production and marketing, and how do you help protect smallholders from investments which might lead them into poverty traps when climate change gets them? Uh, and, and so, Jana, how do we make the resilience message and the small tales, the, the small information, the disruptions that your local information would generate, how do, we, how do we enhance the importance of that so that it can influence the traditional uh, ag development paradigm? Bunch of questions. Uh, so I'll start with Amy and then uh, make the round towards me. <laughs> yeah, those are very difficult questions that you both raised. Um, and I don't think there's one right answer for your question, particularly what we're trying to do, and there's lots of ways to reduce risk, but match up appropriate agricultural practices to soils that are, you know, match that up a little bit, which in, will help reduce risk, but it doesn't deal with a lot of it still. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's a very challenging question. And then to the question about um, inequality and how we deal with inequality and private data, this is still a realm that I'm learning a lot about. Um, one, one way we're doing that, the, the Lampy Cast team, is to keep all of our data open access. But as we start thinking about using these technologies in the U.S., issues of privacy become more important. And we are talking about this, but haven't really figured out a way to deal with that. Um, and same kind of goes with inequality. So obviously, there's certain types of people that have access to cell phones, certain types of people who can read, certain types of people who speak English. And 
that's another thing that as the lone social scientist on our team, I'm trying to make sure that everyone understands that these there are possible negative consequences of our technology um, and how to deal with that. Also, not super sure, but it's something that is is on my mind particularly um, and is really important that we're not um, kind of increasing inequalities that already exist between smallholder farmers. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll take uh, uh, the first question, uh, the question on, on uh, digital device, uh, sorry, uh, uh, digital divide that is uh, uh, very persistent in developing countries, especially in Africa. So uh, I'll try to bring three points around that question or, or thinking around that question. The first one is uh, the whole uh, technology is transforming. The mobile technology is penetrating in many uh, remote areas, but still there are a lot of people there behind. So in that case, maybe one approach would be, uh, uh, in, in my slide, I was talking about the fourth approach that is about aggregation. And when I say aggregation, aggregation it doesn't mean aggregating only community. It's about organizing small farmers. And if they pull together, they may start accessing or they may get that strength or, or economic strength or technological strength to pull together you know, their own resources and start accessing uh, information they need. So organizing them around some very good social uh, capital principle would be uh, uh, one approach you know, to, to bridge this gap. And, and when I think of uh, this question furthermore, uh, recently I have started interacting with many capital ventures in Silicon Valley. And it's very interesting, you'll find again very enterprising, very disruptive kind of you know, uh, thinker in Silicon Valley and they want to help, they want to come to these issues, but they don't know how to, how to go there, uh, who to talk to and what to do. You know? They have very interesting brain, they have money also, and they're sitting on, interest is also there but we don't know how to connect the real problem with the real solution. So maybe it's, it's our problem. How do we connect? How do we, that's the, that's the reason I was using that word. How do you do backend engineering to connect them? You know? And going back to uh, 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 your question again, uh, there are a lot of apps evolving and a lot of technologies evolving. For example, Google Engine. Five years back, we were never sure of what to do with the remote sense data. But, but nowadays it's available, you know, with few change in code, uh, uh, you can get what is happening on crop, what is, and similar thing is, things are happening in, in early warning system also. But we need to know, and we need to kind of calibrate with the requirement of ground and make them available. So uh, there is some issues related with accessibility, pricing, take, take, testing the technology, but also there are ways around. And we need to start thinking about how do you make these technologies available to small farmers uh, uh, we are thinking about. Uh, uh, going back to your question, uh, when I think of small farmers working in uncertainty, uh, there might be two approaches. One approach is we shouldn't be thinking about one input. We have to st start thinking about bundle of inputs they need. You know, it, it can range from technology to seed to information to, you know, if something happens like failure of crop, what they would do, you know. So insurance, you know, so we have to start thinking about bundle of inputs they would be needing. And also in terms of their activities, we have to start thinking about, you know, just taking principles from uh, resilience. How do you create diversity or how do you create bundle again in their activities? So if one thing falls, they can fall back to something else they are doing. So we need to, we need to kind of, you know, very, very uh, smart. Uh, we need to be very smart. And, and again, I feel like we shouldn't be thinking, we should be going back to them and asking what they are doing. And there are many good examples sitting on ground. So maybe we, needs, we can use ASIC or many anthropologists we have you know, here in our audience uh, to understand what would be the right approach to understand uh, this whole you know, issues of uh, diversification and creating bundle around and around. And, and we are hearing that word enabling environment. So we need to be very thorough in understanding what is that enabling environment they would be needing uh, in, in this kind of uncertainty. Thank you. Uh, Vishal, uh, you were not explicitly addressed, but of course mm -hmm. uh, no, should be able to no, uh, Then Diana. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't have it. Okay, yeah. Okay, so coming back, uh, coming back to your question, uh, a challenging one, but I mean, we are not monitoring or we're not setting up this monitoring initiative to be able to say, hey, we monitored, we, we, we came up with a report. In the end, we want to influence the agenda and we want to 
um, to raise the awareness of, of these issues, of, of the issues of, 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 of certain gaps between administrative level, between people and institutions, and also, um, yeah, the gaps of, of, um, of financial support, but also the gaps in understanding what are the root, uh, what is at the root causes of this tremendous increase in disaster losses, and also the um, the relevance of these small and medium scale events, um, and and in terms of the narrative where this where this should lead to, is even more to look at prevention and risk mit mitigation because the especially the, the small and medium scale disasters, they often can be prevented. They are often, they can be mitigated so that their, uh, the damages that they are caused are not substantial anymore. So when we talk about these large scale events, uh, uh, events I still agree that preparedness is, is, uh, is, is, is crucial. When we, when we shift the focus in our work really towards the small and medium scale events um, with a high frequency, less reported prevention and integration of, let's say, a risk-informed planning and risk-informed development in, um, across the, across the uh, ad administrative levels and, and, yeah, increased awareness of the interlinkages of a specific hazard and its root causes that are mostly embedded in societal stru structures becomes more key. And I know I repeat something that has been repeated for, for years, that one dollar invested in prevention uh, saves, uh, saves uh, f between four and seven, depending on literature, dollar in response. But I think it cannot be stressed um, sufficiently enough. One more point I would like to make is really the partnership aspect when we talk about, the, about, about that initiative. And I was talking to Salim about his initiative or the initiative of uh, least developed countries to, um, to build up a university network. And we were already exchanging how building local capacities also at the university level of future people shaping the agendas is also crucial to such an initiative. Because yeah, we do not want to create data that is there um, just in, in the cloud or on paper, but this can be used to really work towards um, improving the situation and reducing the root causes that lead to these uh, events. Thank you, Jana. This, uh, we need to take as they close uh, the final words. Uh, we have used up uh, the 10 minutes. Uh, I will be very short. Uh, for me, it has been an uh, exciting contribution. Thank you very much from my side. I think it's uh, good to give you a hand. Uh, uh, if I could summarize, if I could summarize in a nutshell, but still, of course, being very incomplete, I think we are in an extremely transformative stage when thinking about resilience. Simply, but not only by uh, what ICT is 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 actually feeding into the system. As a former engineer, I would say the way to deal with it is try. Uh, we need leaders. Uh, coming back to Erin, uh, some failures will happen, but I think this is how progress is made. So. Let's start from here, and uh, I'll give uh, the floor back to Roger Mark. Thank you very much. I think we've had a really rich um, morning, and we have an opportunity to continue the, di the discussion for another two hours. So we have um, a lunch prepared for you, um, a light lunch, but it's really an opportunity to continue to engage and, and further dialogue, make connections. If you have some questions or work that you're doing that you want to share with colleagues, this is the opportunity to do this now. So we've really specifically created some networking space because we think this is really critical. Um, as you know, our events here at the Wilson Center are webcast live, so I know a number of colleagues have been tuning in online and been seeing a lot of, of excellent tweets about the discussion today. Um, the webcast will be video archived, so you will be able to come back to it. My team will be working to produce summaries of the discussion today, so you will have a repository of what we have discussed today and that will be held at newsecuritybeat.org. So please uh, continue to come back to that. I invite you now to join us for our, our reception, a light lunch, and continued networking and dialogue. So thank you very much.